way you usually can hear God speak to you. And so we've seen, we've seen what it looks like to engage holy war in a positive pattern. And we've seen how it is to engage holy war in a negative pattern. I give you positive, I give you negative. Choose positive. Good morning, church. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm pretty sure you guys are warmed up with the whole Sia Mangena feel, right? So you, you, must, you must have noticed that actually from the a previous segment of our, our series Courageous, we've changed something, there's a bit of flavor, there's a bit of us in it. But I think even more so, there's something of this same expression that we find uh, exactly in the passages of Joshua that we see. Uh, what's funny is this morning we had Joshua leading us in worship, so you know that we are geared up, guys. We are really, we are really, really in there. Like we're set up uh, for this for this whole thing. But actually, you must you must remember the story. I must take you back so that we all kind of in the same space. And I hope that you guys did your own work last time when I started the series. I said, please read at least the first seven chapters with us. So now we continue with our homework. We, we need to be going from chapter 8 and all the way up till the very end. Because actually we really don't want to leave some meat, as Temba said, from the bone. We really want to eat everything that God has given us. So that we can appreciate even more so what God is trying to direct us in through the scriptures. So part of the story is this, is this great victory that uh, Joshua and the, and the rest of the gang actually win. Uh, we are in chapter 6 where we see the walls of Jericho fall, which feels like actually what God had promised that we take this land seems to be real. It seems to be coming to pass. And in fact, we didn't even have to do much. We just circled around, blew some trumpets, and the walls fell down without us doing anything. What an act of God. What a miraculous thing. Surely God is with us. Right? So, and, and there's this just overwhelming sense and just last week uh, the video was re released when uh, Greg was reminding us that actually it did not end there the story did not end there unfortunately in chapter 7 what we see is the Israelites sin and it's this one man who's just outside of the bounds of God's directives he is sowing disunity in in a way of his own greed and his own pride and what does he what does he do he actually takes the things that God said were devoted for destruction and takes them for himself. He's like a little gold there, a little silver there, nobody will see. The reality is when Joshua is going out to battle, he thinks God is with us, walls have just fallen, we are going in, it is a sure thing. The problem is God was not with them. God had seen that somebody had sinned. And so we pick up the story right from there. We are jumping into chapter 8 right after these guys find themselves in trouble. In fact, the chapter 7 ends with the words, the valley of Eka, which is the valley of trouble. This is the place, that's, that's, a, that's the name of the place that, that, that uh, Achan was then uh, what's it, judged. He died at that very place, and that place was named the place of trouble. So we're picking the story back up from there. In fact, it's, it feels like we ended in a, on an anticlimax, right? Like, we, we've just had this amazing victory. <laughs> what now? What now? And this is why we felt, actually, there's much more to this. There is much more to this. And God has called us to truly, with his Siba he's called us to truly uh, go through. So I want to read kind of the first few portions we're not going to read through the whole passage. As I said, your homework is to go read the passages yourself and really begin to pick up these truths. Uh, but we're going to be highlighting the big themes of each chapter as we go. And so uh, we're going to read from Joshua verse 1 and 2 and Joshua verse 17. And then we're going to begin to break down this whole thing. And it reads as follows. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear... And do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. 
only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay a, a, an ambush against the city behind it. So before we jump to verse 17, so we see this thing. We're already seeing that God is already with them. Let's pray and then let's jump into the rest of the thing. God, we're so thankful to you, Lord, that we get to see how you've walked alongside others in history. That we get to see, Father Lord, what happens when we are with you, Father Lord, how we are able to truly enter even territories that are, in a sense, Father Lord, scary to enter, to step into faith in things that really feel like they are not for the taking. Thank you, Father Lord, that this story describes how there is this ebb and flow with regards to how we relate to you. Whenever we believe and we trust, my God, there is great victory. Whenever, Father Lord, we take our own way, there is great dismay. So I pray, Father Lord, that this morning that we'd see really the patterns of our mentality and how they affect how we engage in everything that you've called us to do. So we pray for that, my God. Won't you help us, Holy Spirit, to hear with our ears and to take heed with our hearts. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. And so already what you, are, what you are seeing there is this amazing thing that happens at the beginning. These guys have just failed. These guys have not done what God had called them to do. In fact, God had devoted one of them to destruction. In fact, a few of them, about 3,000 men, died because of the sin of this one man. So there's devastation in disobedience. So this morning, what I want us to look at is actually this, this, through this comparative lens of looking at what are, what are the negative and positive patterns of holy war. What are the negative and positive patterns of holy war? So our title is that, the patterns of holy war. The first thing that I want to point out to us is this. Already from the beginning, what we are seeing is this sense that there's an assurance that God brings about. There's an assurance that God brings about. And so that's the first pattern of holy war, is that there must be absolute certainty before you jump into any war. What does Jesus have to say about this? Jesus says that before a king even goes into battle, he accounts for himself. How many soldiers does he have in comparison to the other, other king's soldiers? You don't engage in something that you are not certain to win, right? Before you build a building, you, you check if you have enough money for the bricks. Although you you start the building without this money, what happens is actually you'll find your building in ruins before it even is erected. You see that? And in the same light, what you see in verse 6, <laughs> in chapter 6 of verse 2 in Joshua, is that actually there was this sense of assurance for Joshua when he came to Jericho, that the Lord said to them, Joshua, see, I have given you Jericho into your, I've given Jericho into your hands. Therefore, go. Do you see that assurance? There's the, the sense that God is saying, hey, I, I've got this. You, you are cleared to go. But here's the problem in chapter 7, what we saw previously, is that Joshua goes in without any word from God just after everything that happened. He's organized. Him and his men are talking about who's going to go and who's not going to go. And then they carry, carry on. Only later in verse 11, God starts speaking and his word is, Israel has sinned. <laughs> so not even a mission of go, it's Israel has sinned. What's happened there? The problem here is actually these guys went ahead without God's say-so, without God's assurance, without God saying, guys, I've given you this moment, take it. So God had not said that. So part of what you and I have to ask ourselves is, has God said? Has God said? This applies in every aspect of our life. God, I want to go to so and such, such a place, but has God said? Have you taken time to inquire? Have you paused to ask if God has truly called you to such and such a place, to do such and such a thing? So I think that was the first issue there. It's a first negative uh, aspect of engaging holy war without the assurance 
of the Almighty God saying, yes, it is time to go. But we're seeing some change, right, in Joshua 8. We're, we're seeing finally that God is the one who's saying, hey, wait, don't fear. Do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people and the city. So God is re-engaging with them and he's reigniting that hope again that I am with you. It's God's move first of saying yes that gets Joshua moving this time around. So the first thing is assurance. The second attitude or way in which we should think about holy war is in a measure of purity. Purity. So first assurance, second purity. What do I mean by that? We see a few things happen in the previous chapters, right? So Timber was preaching about how humility is the best posture for any war that we engage in. And in fact, by way of humility, these guys engaged in circumcision, which was a, a sign for God's people being set apart. But the, the intriguing thing that Timber was saying was actually who goes for circumcision days before war? Because, I mean, that is painful. To think that you'd be fighting with spears and swords with other men while you are in pain. If that's not a way of showcasing trust in God, I don't know what is. The fact that God would be the one who fights the battle and not us. That I can be in pain and weak and in, incapable to do anything for myself and yet still the battle is won. Are you seeing that? So there's a sense in which they've purified not only themselves by some ritual, but they've purified their hearts enough to have said, God will be the one who fights the battle. Our hands need not get dirty. They've purified their hearts enough to believe that God, what, he, what God has said would happen, whether they are able to or not. So that's number one aspect of being purified, is the circumcision. Secondly, they perform the Passover. If you remember well what the Passover, the Passover is about, it's actually about, about how Jesus pulled them out of slavery in Egypt. And in fact, the very moment of Passover is actually about the angel of death coming to every house, taking a firstborn child to death, but the only with the exception of somebody having put the blood of their lamb on the post. There's a sense in which there's a protective barrier in this blood of the lamb put on the post, which is a foreimage of what Christ would do thousands of years to come. That there would be protection from, the, from death because of sin. And that's a form of consecrating, a form of purifying ourselves. Is that actually none of us through the blood of lambs or through offering of our own can we do anything. Purification comes purely from what God does himself. You see that? So the, 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 the purification from death in itself comes by way of a sacrifice of something else. Yeah. The third is this encounter. We saw Temba speak about this again, where he encountered the, 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 the general of the army of God. And here's the thing about encounter that's interesting, is that actually none of us by encountering God can ever leave that space without being changed. Yeah, that's true. There is no one in the Bible, no in life today, who's ever encountered the true and living God without something in their lives being totally changed and transformed. It, it makes me recount that even as much as Joshua is having his own moment of encounter, that Moses before him had the same at the burning bush, where he had to remove his sandals because he was before the presence of God. This was a holy place, and he does the same. And it reminds me of another moment in Isaiah 6, where we see that Isaiah again encountering God where he's in this trance and he feels that he sees God's uh, heavenly throne and at that very place what happens there's a consecration of sorts that happens there's a coal that's taken from the from the altar and it's touched by, to his tongue and is able now to speak on behalf of God are you seeing that encounter encounters with God always leads to purification always leads to purification. So the second thing that we do is purify ourselves. The problem here, what happened that was wrong here, 
is that Achan decided that he would take what God had devoted to destruction and he would make it his own. And the problem with taking something that's devoted for destruction and making it your own is that you're tainting yourself. You yourself will be devoted for destruction in turn. God is a holy God. God will have nothing to do with what is unholy. That is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. He separated himself from Adam and Eve because he is holy and they were not at the time. So there's always separation between what is holy and what is is unholy. So purification is the positive way in which you and I can engage in anything that God calls us to do. We have to consecrate ourselves. So instead of circumcising, in taking the Passover or encountering God, God, Achan took devoted things. He stole and he lied. Those are not unfamiliar to us. You and I are very well capable of doing the same. We are capable of, again, claiming for ourselves things that God has not given to us. And sometimes you may say, but I've not taken anything that does not belong to me. But actually, your sense of envy of others is a problem. When you see somebody else being blessed by God in some way or another, and your heart just says, no, God, how dare you give that one, two, and three to this person? Already your heart is speaking to you and telling you that actually you deserve that more. In fact, God is unjust to have given somebody else something that you want. You see what I'm saying? Our hearts are not too far from this. And in fact, we find ourselves in places where God did not call us all because we are on the hunt for things that God never gave to us. And so maybe examine your own heart in this. Are you engaging in your walk of faith in a way that you are not purified in the way you conduct yourself? The third of these ways in which we should engage holy war is unity is unity in chapter one uh, what you saw is this amazing command to those who had already attained their land just before they came into jericho and god is calling them like to the half tribe of manasseh and and he says to them no guys listen you guys are going to come back to your land you're going to occupy it you're going to be in peace once you guys have actually helped the rest of your brothers acquire the rest of the land So there's a call for them to actually be united and be one with each other. To be in one accord. In chapter 7, what we saw is something different. Is that actually only as they were discussing how they're going to do this without actually hearing from God, they they came up with their own wisdom and said, no, 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 like, listen, don't don't belabor other people with, with this stuff. Only let, like, a portion of them go and then the rest of us will park and then we'll see how, how things go. Already, they've already break, broken God's pattern in the one accord that they were supposed to be walking in. In oneness of mind, in oneness of actually charging in and doing what God has called them to do. And I think each of us have this mentality in how we tend to do uh, uh, faith and life together. You see, one of the things that COVID-19 destroyed was this sense of urgency for us to be together. The sense of urgency for us to be in and amongst one another. The reality is fighting a battle by yourself on the side means that you are most likely to be devoured than when you are with others. You are most likely to be attacked. We've been talking about uh, the spiritual warfare the last two, two weeks. And I think one of the biggest, most devastating things that we could ever do to ourselves in our walk of faith is isolate ourselves. Is to not be vulnerable enough, even when you're around people, to say, actually, this is where I'm at. Can you help me? Can you show me the ways of God? Can you, can you direct me to where I can... Sometimes you feel like you don't even know where God is because like, life is just happening. But do you ever take time to say, by myself, I'm not going to actually get this right. <laughs> Yo, I don't even remember last time I prayed. Can you show me how to get back onto the... Oh, I, I, I'm trying to pray, but just like I'm feeling so tired. I, I can't even utter a word to God. Can you help me 
usher my back, myself back into God's space. I think isolation is one of the things that will kill us the most. Unity is the way in which God... You know, my favorite, uh, my pet peeve actually around, around this stuff often is around umjolo. And I'll say it because actually it's the thing that annoys me the most about how we engage in it. Because how we often engage in it is as if as soon as I'm infatuated and I've found what I think is love, man, nobody should be telling me anything. It's me and my person. Sure. Nobody should be involved. Don't come in between us. You're going to ruin what we have. Sure. But little, <laughs> little do you know that actually who's going to ruin that is you yourself. Sure. Yes. Because you've not sought for wisdom. You've not looked for anyone to actually help you engage in that world. You've not helped, nobody has helped you ask the right questions even to get to a place of really knowing whether this is good for you or not. I'm just trying to give you one practical example. There's many others in which we engage, whether it's work sometimes, whether it's decisions whether to move cities or not. Like, we make so many decisions without the help of others who are wise amongst us. You know, wise counsel does bring good to us. So my, my thing to you is actually have others around you to help you. The problem with Aiken is actually when he was thinking about these things, about taking things away, he did not consult with anyone. Did you notice? Everything was happening in secret. So the desires of his heart just chowed him by himself. There. Had he said so, to someone, hey, you know, I'm thinking of taking some gold. Maybe somebody might have said, Chief, do you remember that God said we shouldn't? And you see that? Sometimes seeking counsel from yourself is the best possible thing. I know the world tells us to do you. Like you're a lone wolf, you're a lone ranger. There's a false sense of independency. The reality is none of us are independent in this world. Each and every one of us need someone to help us. So I mean, I've given us this huge backdrop of kind of the comparisons between holy war uh, between negative and positive holy war and that's what we that's what we are engaging and actually as we kind of zone in to chapter 8 itself which is where we are today the things that you see is what are the perils of negative patterns what are the perils of negative patterns the first I'll argue is this, disobedience. Complete and utter disobedience is a problem. Because disobedience, as we see, directly correlates to, for Aiken, death. For some of us, loss of things that we would have otherwise gained. And you will see that with the issue of impatience as well. So the problem with disobedience is that we don't trust God. But disobedience is just simple. You don't trust, you disobey. You trust, you obey. It's as simple as that. But the problem here is actually he did not trust that God wanted good for him. That God at some point along the line would give him every bit of riches that he had wanted at the very moment. So there's a lack of trust in the goodness of God. So what does he do? He carries on, he does this thing for himself without any regard for whether God... I mean, God says, I will give you the land of milk and honey. How much more do you want to hear? God has just dropped like a fortified city in front of your eyes. Can you not believe and trust that God will do this small thing, which is to give you a bit of gold and silver? Sometimes we do that, friends. We don't reflect long enough on how God has been faithful to us in far bigger things in our lives that we end up in small things. We end up not trusting him and taking the wrong route. So those are, it's a peril of a negative mentality in how we engage what God has called us to do, which is to live lives holy before him. The second is impatience. Being impatient with God. Sometimes it's not because God is saying no to you. Sometimes it's just that God is saying wait. The irony here is actually the second time around when God has been the one who gives the instruction. Guess what happens? He says, oh, by the way, the plunder, it's, it's yours. The first time God didn't say anything. 
they engage the thing by themselves, no consultation, and then on top of that, this guy sins and takes things for himself. The second time around, God is the one who says, I've given it to you. I've given it to you. And this happens. He is very impatient with God. Very impatient with God. He's like, I... Uh, Jericho has fallen. One plus one is equal to two. Now that these things are falling, we must just gather. We must just gather. And I think it's part of what Timbo was saying earlier, that actually sometimes how we measure whether God is faithful is whether God has given me what I want. But God's faithfulness is not measured that way. In fact, God's faithfulness, faithfulness is actually properly measured whether he's done his will whether he's done what he said he would do. That's, that's your measure. It's not whether he's given me what I want. Because if that's the measure, that means if I want to kill you and you want to kill me, and that happens, that benefits none of us. Because our desires can so go so far astray. But God is the one who dictates what is good for us and what is not. So, what are the patterns of impatience in your own life? Where you're just so anxious to get the stuff that you are looking for that you're not willing to wait on God's go-ahead. And to evaluate that stuff for yourself. And so the question here is, how do we then re-engage? How then do we re-engage positive patterns of, of holy war? How do we re engage them? I think we're given a clue at the end of chapter 8 here. So I want to read the four, last four verses of this passage just to bring us into a land. In verse 32, it says, And there is, they, and they, in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native-born with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in the front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of, that, of, of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among, among them. So what we're seeing here is actually renewal of covenant. It's a moment where the Israelites, again, now that God has given them victory, a, sense, a fresh sense of hope in what God had called them to do, a redirecting. And in fact, at each and every point, what you see is obedience, obedience, obedience. Opposite of what happened in chapter 7. You see, when, when, when God says they should do something, they do it. When he says to Joshua, lift up your staff, for I have given this to you. He lifts it up and the guys march in to ambush the people. So you see the city of Ai is put down and at that very moment what happens is these guys see the folly of their ways. They see they have to re-engage with what God had called them to do. And there's two things that I want to pick up on, on this. It's verse 32 and verse 34. The first thing is Joshua writes, he rewrites the law on, the sto on stone tablets, sort of reenacting what Moses had done. And I think there's something of a practical nature there for us as well. How often do you sit down, engage God's word, and seek to write it in the tablet of your heart? How often do you sit down, consume God's word enough, Meditate on it enough that it encapsulates your heart enough so that you don't deviate from it. You see, this practice of writing helps. And it does, practically so. You can journal 
God's word. That's one of the ways in which people have done it for ages, where they've actually written how the word of God affects them and impacts them at the moment. People write their prayers down, or write anything that pops out to them to remember again what God said to them at that point in time and season. How often do you practice writing God's word down in the tablet of your heart so that you don't deviate from it? That is the same command that he gave in chapter 1, right? Don't turn from the left or to the, or to the right from my word. The second is that remember blessing and curse. Remember blessing and curse. Now you could say, Chief, why are you saying curse? Like, can, can we just remember the good stuff here? There's something important about remembering both. You see, if you go back to Deuteronomy, over and over again, God says, I give you blessing, I give you curse. I give you death, I give you life. I urge you, choose life. Choose life. The, the contrast between the two, just like we did today, looking at the negatives and the positives, helps us see what is the better of the two. It's important for you and I to assess what is good mentality when it comes to engaging our lives that are meant to be, in, in fact, I think in chapter, when we did the first part of this, I said that you and I are engaging in a war. And this war has different tools and has different weapons. Ours is the gospel. It's how the gospel is working in our lives. It's how the gospel is impacting those in which we are engaging. The problem stays the same. How, in, how are you and I engaging in this current situation? Are we assessing what is good and what brings blessing in life? Are we assessing what is bad and what brings death and curse? And are we choosing the right thing? So part of engaging the covenant is for us to understand what will happen, the consequences of each of those decisions. And we've seen them with Achan. And we are seeing them now in chapter 8 that actually, now that they've re-engaged in the way that they're supposed to, things are all of a sudden different. Will you write God's word, the tablets of your heart? Will you remember both blessing and cursing so that you are able to make the right choice? Let's relook at this before we come to a land. First thing is assurance. First thing is assurance. Best pattern of holy war is for us to be assured by God. What I love about the scriptures is actually you always get to see how Jesus fully fulfills every aspect of this. And when it comes to assurance, he doesn't do any less. In 2 Corinthians, it speaks about how the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. You see, you and I may be on this side of Joshua where we have seen what happened with them, where we have seen Jesus Christ, the Messiah, come. And we may live in a world where we don't have to carry swords around in order to fight our own wars. But there is an ongoing war. But in that ongoing war, there is one who's already triumphed. There is one who's already fulfilled God's promise to overcome all things that you and I face. And that is Jesus Christ. And that's why scripture says, in Jesus Christ, the promises of God are yes and amen. But I want to highlight something about assurance. There's an application there for us. Is that it's an assurance only when we go. It's an assurance only when we go. It, it took them getting in and doing the thing for God to be acting in that way. So where God has said, go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He meant it. So I want to point out something to you. There's something happening this Saturday. So you, 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 you would know that we have a CLT in this church. And as a CLT, at the beginning of the year, when we started, we decided we're not just going to have meetings every week. We're, we're going to meet, we're going to pray. But before, before we even get into the business the first time, we, we said, no, we're going to obey. We're going to go out into the streets of Bromford and find out where people are at. We're going to pray for people. We're going to evangelize. Because there's no use in us calling you to do what we don't do as leaders. We want to be faithful to the things that we call you to. So there's this happening this next Saturday. So after the CLT has met in the morning from 8 till half past 8 till 10, we invite any and everyone in this church. Come join us. 
come see part of God's assurance in saying that he will give us brown to share the good news, to use the weapon of the gospel to bring people to the fold so that many others may know God's assurance as we do. So join us this Saturday as we evangelize. Don't, don't hold back. Come, let's obey what God has called us to do. Second thing is purity. Now, you may think that, okay, this means that I have to get circumcised or observe the Passover as it was or uh, I have to do some radical encounter of God. I'm not opposed to radical encounters with God. I, I hope you have them. I hope you have many of them. But I think there's something far superseding that. The fact that we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and through that he's called us righteous. You and I need not wait for ritual purity to do something to obtain it. You and I are already, <coughs> sorry, you and I are already cleansed and made clean. Remember what Peter says, like, no, if you're going to wash my feet, you better wash my whole body. And Jesus is like, you, you fool. Chief, I've already done that. Your body is already clean. The thing that needs to happen with you is from time to time, let's wash your feet because you walk in the world of those who are unclean. So you and I, from time to time, purification looks like us, again, putting ourselves in positions where God refreshes us in the place and the state that he has given us already. So how are you doing in terms of the rhythms of church? Do you come to Sunday services with an expectation that God would speak through the worship and would speak through his word to revive your sense of call in him? Do you go to community group where you are vulnerable and pouring things out so that others around you, as we spoke earlier, can really help you and shape you and guide you? Do you have close friendships that allow you to speak freely, even when you are speaking foolishness, so that they can help you be corrected or encourage you where you are going right? So purity looks like that for us as, a, as believers. It looks like ongoing sanctification, ongoing kind of practical things that we do that allow us to align with our now found righteousness in Jesus Christ. What of unity? What of unity? I think God gives us the best gift for this, the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, when you read the book of Ephesians, part of the primary issue that grieves the Holy Spirit is the sowing of disunity among the saints. The Holy Spirit is the one who's building up this church in unity. And part of how he's doing it is that he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. And the Holy Spirit is not inconsistent. So if he's speaking to me and he's speaking to you, there's a sense in which you and I will be in one accord. You and I will be walking the same paths. You and I will be doing the same things. There's no way in which you and I are moving in different courses. So that's why uh, in Galatians, Paul says, walk in step with the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit. So do you cultivate this presence of God? Do you cultivate listening to the Spirit? Do you quiet in your mind and your do you take time to actually say, Holy Spirit, be the one who guides? You hear that, friends? So these are the three ways in which you and I <clears throat> can practically engage holy war. Come to worship nights. That's where we do that together. Worship in your own spare time. That's how you can do that. Ignite God's the sense of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Pray, 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 friends. That's where you, you can hear God speak to you. And so we've seen, we've seen what it looks like to engage holy war in a positive pattern. And we've seen how it is to engage holy war in a negative pattern. I give you positive, I give you negative. Choose positive. Choose positive. So I'll ask Timber to come help us respond.